Great. So yeah, thanks so much everyone for joining us today. I will start slowly so we still give some time to people for people to join. So this is the first out of three sessions we have been organizing around the umbrella topic of ethics and AI. We'll, and we want we want to use them to step out a bit or back from the dominant dominant AI discourse. And today we'd like to constructively, let me say, explore the concept of innovation and, and define innovation from a maker pers perspective. So the, the UNDP Human Development in the Anthropocene Report 2020 stated that if equity, innovation and stewardship become central to what it means to live a good life, then human flourishing can happen alongside easing planetary boundaries. And I think, however, um, how we define this innovation concept therein needs a very careful and conscious defining in order to to live up to its promises. Uh, because, yeah, oftentimes or many times we define innovation as or as a synonym for tech innovation. So by technology is human held, human made. It holds amazing opportunities and we have other sessions around that. And it also, however, holds a lot of risks, forms of oppressions, exclusions, right infringements, etc. So if we let the, the ever latest technology or if we let the AI dominate uh, dominated discourse or the AI discourse dominate uh, our innovation agenda, I think that um, relates also to who's part of it, the financial flows, economic models, etc. around it, we, we lose power. And we lose focus on the fast diversity of context and what matters where and for whom. And let's think about the many types of innovation we as citizens, but also as makers, engage in day, day by day. So innovation that, yeah, that does not depart from, from tools or from technology embraces um, that innovation is also rooted in, in our well-being, in community dynamics, in our understanding and enactment of care and justice, and that it should be all life affirming. So... Uh, me throughout my my work life, let's say, I always advocated for an understanding of innovation as what truly matters in each context. So, what is it that really resonates with our communities, our ecosystems, of all life in each political, economic, cultural, infrastructural, etc. context, and which tool and methods play a role in in enabling this? And how do we ensure transparency, accountability, and and human rights in in all of this? Right. So as much as no no tech will fix our, our meta crisis, so to say, um, as much do we need to position our collective understanding and needed framing of innovation, I believe, and, and, and act it so that we avoid situations where the tools we use further exacerbate the issues we are we're actually trying to, to address or to solve. So let's build yeah, on this opportunity and, and make our voices heard uh, with this outcome of this collective practice and really this session is meant as a start of a conversation around that which which can be a start of an iterative process that we build and also this session is, is and this conversation we have today is super linked to the other ones we will have in October and and what we make out of it basically right so to start all of this we will now hear from our two speakers and giggers uh, Jill and, and Thomas about their amazing work and how innovation is framed therein. Before we will then go in a little co-creative process, this is where the what the mural is for, where we uh, collectively map our understanding of innovation and how we then relate that to technology or to AI. So let's start with yeah, a big welcome to Gilberto Vieira and Thomas Hervé Mboankudu. Jill is the director and co-founder of Data Levy a citizen-generated data laboratory about Brazilian favelas, and he's also a PhD student in his final stages in urban studies and has been researching the centrality of urban peripheries in the era of data coloniality. Super happy to have you here, too. And then welcome to Thomas, who already did the step to his PhD, a Cameroonian scientist specialized in decolonial studies and STS approaches, and he's currently a researcher in residence at the International Center of Expertise in Montreal on artificial intelligence, where Thomas is working on better inclusion and representation of Africa in the international ecosystem of AI. So big welcome to you as well. And I think, Jill, you're going to start and you want to share your screen as well, right? 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, the introduction. I will, I prepared something just to, I, I told to, to tell my and Kirsty just to organize my ideas. Um, it's easier to me, for me. So yes, let's see. Okay, can you see the presentation? Nice. Yes. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. I think I don't I don't know um all of you. So, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's been a while since I could uh, participate on gig meetings and activities. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I'm currently going through a very long complex phase here at work. Uh, Kirsty says I'm I, I, I'm on, on the on, on my final part of my PhD, so it's uh, it's it's a lot. But, but um, I'm going to present some ideas in the next ten minutes. It's just ten minutes, so it's some quickly ideas, and I hope it will provide input for more collective discussion here on our group. So uh, first of all, I want, uh, I would like to briefly introduce Data Lab, the organization I founded eight years ago in one of the largest favelas in Latin America, here in Rio de Janeiro, called Complexo da Maré. This is the, the, the team that I, that I work with. And in summary, we are a citizen-generated data laboratory focused on race, gender, and territory or territorialities. And our team consists of young people from various peripheries, and we have been working in several favelas and cities across Brazil. I'd like to show a one-minute video that summarizes some of our work here. So it's easier to me than just speak. A maioria das pesquisas tenta descobrir o que todo mundo faz, o que todo mundo pensa, o que todo mundo sabe. Mas você? Você não é todo mundo. Se você é negro, LGBTQIA+, ou moradora do Complexo da Maré, por exemplo, sua realidade não reflete o que as grandes pesquisas apontam. Para provar isso, é só olhar pela janela. Mas os outros só sabem disso porque tem quem pesquise você. O Data Lab é uma organização focada na geração cidadã de dados sobre mulheres, pessoas negras, LGBTQIA+, moradores de favela, enfim, quem importa. Juntando esses dados, a gente consegue responder perguntas que pesquisa nenhuma fez, mas que com certeza você já deve ter se perguntado. Tipo, por que até hoje não tem saneamento básico onde eu moro? Ou será que a água da torneira do rico é igual a minha? Entendendo melhor quem você é, em que ponto você está, fica mais fácil saber quais são as mudanças mais importantes para a sua comunidade e como lutar por elas. Data Lab. Dados sobre quem importa. Você. Well, when I founded Data Lab, our goal was to democratize access to data, culture and train young people from favelas to challenge the increasingly data-driven knowledge production model. In addition, we understood that we could produce quality data ourselves on what is politically hidden by governments and corporations, especially when it comes uh, to the poorest community. I started to understand that we were situating the idea of innovation within a context of new coloniality. And this idea of situated innovation is interesting to me. Uh, Isabelle Stangues is a, a Belgian philosopher whom I admire very much. And it was she who introduced me this idea of situated knowledge. And here I would like to try to combine this idea of situated knowledge with the idea of innovation and following everything what Kirsty uh, presents in, in the beginning. So she said, to be able to situate oneself, to situate what one knows, actively linking this knowledge to the questions one gives importance to and the means employed to answer them, implies being indebted to the existence of others. 
of those who ask all the questions and make a situation matter in another way, who occupy a landscape in a way that prevents appropriation in the name of an abstract idea, whatever that may be. So I think that this idea of um, being in debit to the existence of others is a, is an, is an, is a, uh, a good idea. For us, innovation is not just about new technologies or buzzwords like artificial intelligence as, as Kerstis uh, present, but Heather, how these tools can be adapted and imagined to create solutions that make sense in realities like those of favelas. More than that, we've been reflecting on whether technologies like AI are even necessary and whether they contribute or only make our lives more difficult. The concept of innovation that dominates powerful structures in Brazil is important from global North context. You know that. And cannot, and cannot account for local realities, which are often considered inferior. Yet for me, this is precisely where the answers to the global problems we face to daily to, to life, such as the climate catastrophe, or the rise of the far right. My question is, how do we reclaim ancestral values and hack so-called future tools and systems so they work in a context where resources are limited and the challenges are urgent? After all, this is the reality of the most of the world, isn't it? Now, uh, this topic could be discussed for a long time, and I'd like to present them uh, provocations before showing some of the work we've done here. I've selected some projects that combine this critique of technological in uh, innovation, bringing the debate on artificial intelligence to the to the forefront and addressing the risks it presents to the integrity and future of poorest people on the planet. Such as favela residents in Latin America. Of course, I don't want this presentation to seem technophobic, but it certainly doesn't propose a techno solutionism either. So the first one is Coco Zappi or Pupu Zappi. This project is a digital platform that allows favelas residents to report issues with sanitation services through WhatsApp. It's a button-up approach to data collection that highlights how infrastructure issues are managed and can be solved by empowering local communities with accessible technology. Everything in this project is done by people from the community involved in the problem, from the collection of complaints, the anonymization of sensitive data, cross-referencing with public data, community mobilization, etc. Nothing depends on AI, although everything converts on an artificial intelligence project, you know. This is the Tiri Meu Rosto da Sua Mira, or Take Off My Face on Your Target. And this is a campaign aimed at banning facial recognition technologies in public space in Brazil, particularly targeting their use in policy, which disproportionately affects black and poor communities. The project ad advocates for data justice and is an example of how communities can push back against invasive surveillance technologies. Uh, this is Descomplicando IA, yeah, and this, is, uh, this initiative is a series of accessible educational workshops that aim to demystify artificial intelligence for people from favelas and other communities here in Brazil. The project promotes uh, critical digital literacy and ensure that discussions about AI include voices from those often excluded from each debate. And at least, but not less important, CryptoFunk, it's a free event that merges discussions about digital rights, privacy, and security with cultural elements from, from Rio de Janeiro's favelas particularly the funk music. Inspired by the global crypto party movement, it features debates, workshops, and a party with the slogan, encrypt the data and decrypt the bodies. The event focused on empowering marginalized, marginalized communities by promoting digital autonomy, uh, bodily freedom, addressing the, the, the increasing influence of technology on the daily life. 
the themes uh, include freedom of expression, online privacy, algorithm and package, and digital security, all approached from a perspective of integral care, physical, digital, uh, psychosocial. This year, CryptoFunk will take place in November here in Maré, so you're all invited to come to Brazil to dance, funk, and discuss uh, more responsible and ethic AI. We are still looking for support to make it happen, so if one has some idea, let me know. And I think that's it in, in, in this 10 minutes, you know. Uh, at Data Lab, we've learned that innovation doesn't happen top down, as you saw. The most powerful solutions emerge from direct collaboration with local communities, allowing us to co-create technologies that respond to complex challenges. I believe the concept of innovation must be expanded to include the vision and practices of the peripheries. Only in an ethical and inclusive manner. My provocation is how can we reimagine innovation globally, bringing to the table not only new technologies, but also new ways of using them for the common good with active participation for local communities? So I think that's it. Just first inputs to our debate. And thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much Jill, for sharing your insight and your vision. I like the no technophobism, no tech <laughs> neither tech solutionism. <laughs> That's a bit where we want to position this, no, as well. So in yeah. a constructive conversation. And but I think it became really clear already why it's important to to really think about the conceptualization, the definition of concepts we work with every day in order to direct what is happening around them. Uh, or with them. Um, I, I would probably hand over to Thomas and then later we do a moment of conversations all together around this. So Thomas, if you're ready, I'd give the floor to you. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, sorry for the back noise. <laughs> I'm in the airport, as I said. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, I put in the link the work we just released uh, last week on uh, scaling responsible AI uh, in Africa. I really like the intro uh, Casey done about um, what innovation means uh, for specific context. And uh, I want to borrow from there and uh, talk specifically for about the African context uh, where I'm working uh, at Semia. And my role was mostly to bring more voice from uh, um, Africa in the global table around AI. But it, it was very difficult to do this without knowing the context itself, what is going the ecosystem, the AI ecosystem in Africa, uh, what is going on there, on what people are working, and so on. Because if we decide to dive directly with uh, our Western approach, the Canadian approach, it will be like a colonialism, a colonialist way uh, to present to how to scale AI in Africa. So we did a, a series of research on the state of AI in Africa uh, we, within different domains. And we found that there is a lot of activities in um, agriculture, uh, healthcare, and um, climate action and education. So that is the four domain that we found. Uh, that there's a lot of uh, uh, activities going there. But the main question, as we observe, that is mostly a lot of replication. You know, people working in US, in Canada, then, or in Europe, then they replicate their solution in, um, in Africa. And the main question for us was, is it innovation? And even when they are doing this kind of knowledge transfer from Western to Africa, uh, is it aligned with uh, the African context and their needs? That is why we found very important to design uh, a methodology or to put in place the pillar to scale AI responsibly in Africa. 
and uh, the link is in the chat I share with you. And but it's mostly around three pillars that people uh, or stakeholders need to follow in order to scale AI responsibly in Africa. That is what we we we, we have identified. And the first pillar, which is uh, uh, really common, um, is uh, about uh, the the principle, the the, the 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 ethics principle of AI that we have in all these big organizations, UNESCO, Triple uh, A, AIA, and uh, OCDE, and so on. It's always the same word. So transparency. Um, safety and so on you will find them everywhere but what is specific to africa uh, we found that the afrocentric approach which is uh, uh how can i say it, which is embedded in uh, the human centric approach is uh, is very important when we want to scale ai in a responsible way and uh, it's mostly to say that uh the human centric approach uh, focus on designing, uh, developing, and deploying AI solution uh, with, with, with taking account, with taking account uh, the priority of uh, human and the priority of people where the innovation is going to be used. That's the, the main thing. So from the design of the solution to the deployment, so human the end user need to be present and specifically in our context africa need to be present whether they are scholarized or not we need to find a participatory way to include all of them and that is only why we can include what you have specifically in africa what is what our richness i can say traditional knowledge traditional knowledge whether in medical in the medical field in environment or in education, they need to be included when we are designing uh, the solution, the AI solution for our own needs. So this human-centric approach is very important. And it's something that people just mention it like that in the global report or global standard that they write, but it's central in the approach for our ethics, uh, the, 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 scale, the scaling of uh, ethics AI in Africa. And the second things, uh, aside the global standard I, I, I spoke about uh, at the beginning, the, the, the second thing is uh, the necessity to have a permanent uh, monitoring or a continuous risk assessment from the beginning of the process to, till the end. I, 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 this, it means from the formulation of the issue you are planning to tackle, we need to be aware and able to identify biases and mitigate them. So that is why I really like Gilberto, when you say it about data colonialism, is very, very crucial to, uh, it's, very, it's a very big problem. And uh, people, whether you are a government or international organization or a developer, you need to work with, uh, people in the context in order to design their solution, in order to formulate their solution. You need to formulate the solution with them. I'm not, I'm, I'm thinking also about genders, uh, women and uh, so on specifically uh, in, uh, in uh, our context. So from the beginning, we need to have all these stakeholders. It's not just like uh, use Africans or local uh, our local stakeholder, like uh, uh, a beta tester. So you have developed your, your solution <laughs> in Germany, let us say, then you bring them in Africa and ask them to test. And then you just claim that your, 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 your solution is ethics. And uh, because you 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 do you did some workshop uh, yeah. with local uh, stakeholder to, uh, to, to test your solution, no, they need to be included if the solution is designed for them, they need to be included since the beginning of the process, even in data collection and so on. And that is where, where the issue of language come about also. 
because a lot of people they are not speaking in Africa, are not speaking uh, French, English, or uh, Portuguese or Spanish for Lusophone Africa. Uh, they we have our native language, which is also which are also very rich in terms of knowledge. So the AI need to take in account that we this language also the knowledge shared through this language. A lot of designer on one of the big issue we have in AI is that we the African context lack data, for example. We are not lacking data. It's just because the language, the language used to collect data is mainly English and sometimes French. They, they they are not allowing me or my my mother or my grandmother in, in the village to talk in, in our own native language. So I think it's not the issue of uh, the data the, that the data is lacking, but it's the issue, the limit of the AI system, how data are collected. It's not our fault, I think, is the fault of the developer solution. So just to uh, summarize, uh, as I said, scaling AI in Africa is uh, strongly embedded in a, a human-centric approach and uh, in a, a continuous assessment, risk assessment of your AI solution. So it's something very permanent, even during the deployment, you need to assess your solution. So thank you. That is what I wanted to, uh, to, to share with you. And uh, I'll be happy to reply and contribute to Mural. I'm, I'm discovering Mural. Thank you, uh, Casey. I, yeah. We will discover it all together, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thomas. This is uh, super insightful. I certainly have a look at your report uh, or your paper. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, you mentioned super crucial aspects and, you know, it's not, not only the contextuality, but actually crucial elements such as accounting for traditional knowledge and accounting yeah. for the knowledge gap. I think these are two so major issues to tackle and also how this relates to integrating that knowledge throughout an entire developing process, no? So it's these are like mm -hmm. the three cornerstones, I think, um, that, that I extract there. And I, I'd like to open the room for a brief round of questions, if there are, before we then go into mapping out what all of these insights then mean for how we want to define from a maker perspective, the concept of innovation. Laila. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering, uh, maybe it's a bit of a silly question, but how does one start collecting all the data from people who perhaps don't know how to participate just yet? Uh, specific, specifically, when, uh, when talking about AI, well, you need a large connection of data. So instead of trying from a very top-down approach, how does one you know, start like igniting the creation of, of that data without being too imposing on the type of data that is needed? Or how would that come about? Okay, that, that is uh, the, the, the oh, sorry, can I reply or? Please go ahead, Thomas. Yes, that's okay. a very good question, Leila. And um, what we are facing, I'm talking about uh, Bantu. I'm talking about uh, as an African, you know. Uh, and what we are facing is uh, we are facing ex data extractivism in our context because we are not aware of uh, uh, what our data are going to be used for. And uh, even our government don't explain to us what uh why big organization or international organization are collecting data we, there is a lack of uh, data sovereignty uh police so that we can, they can keep and protect their data but what we are advocating is um, uh, the the literacy so trend community uh, is very important to give them a basic education so that they can understand what they have on hands even when they are talking the, the, the knowledge and the data they are, they are sharing when they are talking with this big organization. So for for us, this education 
uh, I can say community education is very important uh, to uh, make people and local uh, stakeholder community aware of uh, what uh, that uh, is. And it's not easy uh, because, you know, you, when people found us or um, uh, international organizations are coming in the field, they already, they already have the agenda, how they will collect data, they need to follow some uh, timeline and so on. So they have don't have time to waste in training people and local community. Only if the government is uh, very, very hard on this point and oblige them to do uh, this kind of training so that people can understand and build trust around uh, uh, around all these stakeholders. So it's a matter, the second point is a matter of trustworthy. So I will sh also share the link here uh, for the, the, the trustworthy data institutional framework that I designed at SEMIA so that how we can work with uh, all these stakeholders and where we put a local community at the center. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks, Thomas, and also thanks a lot for sharing these these resources. Anyone else? Any other questions or comments? Sandra. Hey, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very insightful. Hey. Um, I have a question around um, the innovation um, and does it always have to be something new? Because in Jill's presentation, um, I saw some projects that are already new and where I always hope they get maintained. And I mean, that's also a major political and funding discussion in all areas, also in open source software currently more and more. There was just a recent study published about the maintainers of open source projects. Uh, but what I wanted to say is, like we always have to produce something new, give a new name to a project, give a new technology. Now it's AI and in all the projects you need to put in AI or something else that is like fancy and new. And I wondered how do you, how do people react maybe in your funding bodies or in the governments you're working with or uh, yeah, uh, around you to trying to maintain a great innovation from 10 years ago um, and how, how is this looked at? Really, really good question and very important point to raise indeed. Who wants to respond? Yes, I think I, I can start, but I, I want to listen to Toma um, also. But yes, Sandra, that's it. I think I, I've been reading the, the thoughts of Ricardo on, on innovation, what innovation is, what innovation tech is, what social innovation is, and this uh, and we seem like people who are every every time running, um, um, running to this new thing, you know. But what I'm trying to understand here, and what I'm trying to push on 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 the founders and on on the government um, space that I mean is that we need new people who think about new ideas. <laughs> You know, because what I mean is a symptom of a of a uh, of an ecosystem of innovation is that the same people trying to invent new things. You know, so what I'm trying to what I'm trying to to make people understand and what I'm trying to to experiment, in fact, is if we have other people that don't being don't have been considered on the ecosystem of innovation what these people have to say and when you have some diversity really diversity on the ecosystems of innovation maybe we have some other ideas than this the same ideas with new names you know so i don't know if answer something but um yes that's what i'm trying to to make people understand and what they said is oh but and i i love the 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 last answer of thoma because I think we have so different contexts, but the problem is the same, you know, that is, uh, ah, we don't know, our community don't know anything about data, but it's not true because we are producing data every time and people knows about everything. People listen every time about AI and about uh, chat GPT and about uh, algorithms that we, so people, 
and and there's people on the on our communities that that have knowledge to share and to reframe on new ways to think the world you know so i think the answer is other people to other to other ideas you know new people to new ideas you know Thanks so much, Jill. I really like what you say on no, there are always the same people on the drawing board, so to say, because that exactly is the issue, you know, what I mentioned in the in the intro about the how how power is created and, and distributed and, and why we wanted to have the session where we put forward like another from other people framing of what can innovation actually stand for and how to break loose from this dominant idea that technology or that innovation is intrinsically related to always the latest X, not technology or whatever, but that it doesn't actually have to because who said that, right? So there can be a critical discourse uh, around what innovation means. And I think like positioning ourselves as this really diverse community from so many diverse contexts and bringing in these examples on what actually does happen there and what agency there is and what stewardship actually there is can be really a strong point to to put to put forward. T Thomas, I, I didn't want to. Uh, OK, Th thank you. Okay. Thank you for the great question, uh, Sandra. Um, uh, when we are talking about innovation, I always want to, I have a very ambiguous position on this because I think discourse, discourse and communication is very dangerous for what we really call innovation because people is, some people can just create a tools in their room <laughs> or in their own lab, but the way communication will amplify this thing uh, with uh, all the social media now will uh, sound like it's an innovation. Why is anyone is using it or just a few people in a club using this uh, uh, this creation? I call it cre uh, creation because, but for me, innovation and social innovation is uh, a creation which is uh, used by a wide range of people, so everywhere. So that is my conception of innovation, of what innovation is. But most of the time, people communicate on their creation or creation for a specific project or for a specific fund, for, uh, funders. And I, I feel always very, very sad when I see uh, people go in the field, they take some, some, some picture with the tools that they have developed and they claim and brand it everywhere as innovation. And that is why people like, you know, people are not really interested by what is social innovation now. And funders themselves uh, are mostly interested by this kind of report where we can not really measure the impact of the creation in the field and so on. So I think it's an, an ambiguous word. And um, if you try to closely look at this. I'm not sure that you will receive more funding to do what uh, you are doing, but <laughs> you have to deal with uh, this reality. Yeah. And and being loud about it and having actually solutions and showing what is out there, I think is, a, is an important step therein. No? Are there any other questions or comments before we go into the mural? No, then I would say, let's have a look. I will share. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone who has no access yet. If so, please send me a, a request and I will grant your editor access. I'll share my screen, but yeah, I guess you're all in the, in the board. I probably, I was a bit um, optimistic <laughs> with time. So let me go into the board as well. I will not share my screen probably. Let's see. Um, if you're all in the board, then we can. So now you should all be where I am. I had thought about three steps. Uh, it. Uh, building one one building uh, on the other, but we can perhaps merge the first two and then have time for the third. So 
the idea was to start mapping a bit what we already did now in a conversation of like for for everyone in everyone's context and and thought uh, and action processes what does innovation mean and then in the second step prioritize that in a way or or like uh, assign like importance levels in in our our ideas or thoughts around conceptualizations around innovation so innovation i think how we can merge that sorry okay and the color is any color i can use any color yeah exactly so i'd say we, we take five minutes and and we merge these two a bit so maybe whilst you put your post-its on what is innovation for you you can already rank it on the wheel and okay. then uh, after that we have a look at the the other board nice uh, Percy, maybe you can also share your screen so that the people who will watch the recording uh, video can see the board. Fantastic. Yeah, I will do that. So now that should be the case. Okay. Hi, yes, Kirsty. I or oh, maybe I have to refresh it. That's why I still have viewing rights. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that might be. I also just realized if you do a double click wherever you are, a, a post it will appear. So you don't even have to track them around the board.
So five minutes are up. So let's have a look. I, I think we already collected a lot of things. Um, what would anyone briefly want to, to share their, their you know, innovation definitions or aspects? I see a lot of things. And yeah, it's it's very difficult here to, or probably at least in a first step to to give different ranks to importance. I, I think a, a few here we have, but of course, in a, in a way, everyone, <laughs> everything starts from, from a priority, no? Who would like to share? Every, everything <laughs> is priority, isn't it? Everything is priority. <laughs> For There's the no moment. scale. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I can I, I I can start if you'd like because I also have to leave soon. So okay, thanks, Laila. Um, basically, uh, in, for for me, innovation has to come from something that is uh, functional. I don't think we're at the at the time now where everything should not have a purpose. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. why, you know, putting a necessity or function, but make sure that it's also scalable and customizable is, is really important. I don't know if I put accountability or somebody else put in blue, uh, but uh, so I'll skip that one. Um, and then after, after that, after that innovation comes, it, it then uh, can be contextualized to, to a specific area. So I think more of, of concepts that then are, uh, can be applied in, in different uh, places. So it, it's contextualized and it's uh, very inclusive. And then the application of that innovation can become very bottom up. So I, I'd say that that's uh, in, in my mind how innovation uh, works. And then uh, after that, it's really important that there is a proof of concept and that it uh, becomes feasible. And then I don't know if I put proof of concept again, so I'll just erase that. So that's a little bit of the pathway of how I describe uh, innovation happening. So even though sometimes we do want it to be like bottom up and context oriented and very specific at the beginning, I think it's the merge of, you know, our very uh, global and wholesome mindset that then makes it uh, very innovative and then it becomes a more uh, context uh, based approach and becomes feasible and is uh, translated into something tangible. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Leila. Anyone else would like to share their decisions here before we move briefly, at least, to the next board? And then I also think there's a lot, I mean, we have a lot of overlaps. I think a lot of us have the same understandings and ideas. So later on, I, I can also cluster a bit and, and then reshare so everyone can can have another look after the session so we we won't lose this anyone else who would like to share if not i'd say we at least do a start with the last board where i i thought to to link us back a bit to you know what, what we set out to do in in the sense of uh, no how does our framing of innovation then in the end impact our engagement with ai or should impact our engagement with ai or let's say with with this what we said before now this always latest tech bus and now it said ai later it's something else and so on um which is a bit of a bigger concept or board here so i would say maybe everyone takes one of their uh post-its from the former one from the wheel and puts it up here and and then fills in the the what so what now what part as as much as as you can and we do another five minutes for that if if that's okay for everyone 
to, to at least have a start on it. I apologize, I have to run. So I hope that my text in the first column is a bit um, self-explanatory and if not, I'll continue working on it. But thank you so much for the session to everyone. And I'm happy Thank to you, Laila. Thanks so much for, for thank you, Laila. all bye your bye. valuable input. Thank bye you, bye. very inspiring. Talk Thanks. to you all bye soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Whom do we have left in the room? I'm here and I'm trying to finish my one and uh, the last column. And the last Amazing. Last. So we will let the time, the five minutes run to, to the end.
Oh, here we go. The five minutes are over and we are over time. I don't know how how you are with time, everyone who's still in the room. Jill, I don't know about you. I understand the last column is yours. So if you wanted to, to share with us or if someone else wanted to share their thoughts on it before we wrap up this, that would be wonderful. Yeah, sure. Um, it was just the next, just just the next exercise, I think. But I think one of the most important things that I that I thought is primary to think innovation is local knowledge, and yes, I think what it's um this we can consider multiple contexts with this new way of thinking the. the the problems, the diversity of views, uh, not universal way of thinking. So I think I'm insisting on these days, on this time, on this idea of not, not globalize everything, you know, and we are a global community. So how it's it could be a paradox, but for me, it's a mm -hmm. thing that we can think together, you know, how can we look at the local experiences and local is a very expand context to think universal, to think global, you know? So I think this is a, an interesting way to um, to think AI and innovation. And uh, so what, and I think that's it. I think when we call about diversity, when we call about um, inclusion, uh, sustainability, uh, I think we we can think on this, on these values through local ways, it could be, give us more instrument, more tools to think the global problems and, you know, so, and so what, um, when we, when we, we close, when we put these ideas um, more close to the AI debates and discussion, I think we can have more valuable data we can have more transparency on the AI processes. We have more engagement of people in the process of production of AI. You know, I think one, one terrible problem that we have today is that the idea of engagement on the processes uh, and the production and development of the processes is so close on, on one so specific local community because the the silicon valley is a local community you know it in common so how can we think about more um more diverse local knowledge to think about universal and global so just ideas thanks so much too i actually really like your your statement in a, in a bit of a proactive way not the paradox of uh, how to you know with low solutions localized solution that we are a global community and i think this yeah. is a really good um issue to to play with but play in a serious way to 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 ponder around because then it's different you know like what's the great potential of a global community that is an actual community as we are mm. everyone really bound and active in their localities situated as opposed yeah. to a global tech player conglomerate or whatever no, so and yeah. this is exactly I think the the frick there where where we have to to dig into to to frame our conceptualization of innovation and and you know, what difference is and where there is a potential of global communities, however being all very very deeply rooted and situated, no, in in what is needed yeah. in their not relate uh, relate and active in in their local. Training. Etc. And I think this is something I don't know where where we can take this. Unfortunately, we're out of time here. But uh, I think it's not a conversation that should end here at all, and that we can yeah of course get more shape. Maybe um write write something collectively, um to to really give this give this shape and and frame this. So we will certainly um follow up on the session. I would I would say so on this particular one, and then the all the three sessions together. I mean, the, the rough idea with that was to, to have like a lead this 
to framing like a policy maker policy framework or something so let's see where where we can actually carry this uh is there okay. anyone with the last word or something and no it's and we are out of time yeah thank you so much for joining jill and Toma, i think tomal but yeah thanks so much to the two of you for for sharing your insights and that's always inspiring and full and hope to see you all soon yes thank you thank you kirsty and you all take care thank you bye